Welcome back, fellow mitochondriacs, for an episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. We are going to finally finish out the glycolysis mini series and the potential therapeutic targets in that system. And that means we're going to talk about lactate or lactic acid, lactate dehydrogenase or LDH, and the MCT or monocarboxylate transporters in which lactate used to exit the cell. So let's start off by doing a quick refresher on lactate or lactic acid before we hit LDH as a topic and as a therapeutic target for our purposes of treating cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. So without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so here is where we're going to be starting at. So let's take a refresher, a quick refresher on where exactly in this process we're talking about. So we are talking about the glycolysis process here, and this is where glucose is going to be made into pyruvate. Pyruvate under normal physiologic conditions is going to be put into the mitochondria and made into acetyl-CoA and then ran through the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain with functioning mitochondria and without the PDK break in place. However, because we're talking about mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, broken mitochondria, PDK break in place, we're going to be utilizing an enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase A, or LDH for short, and that is the potential therapeutic target in question here. Now, let's quickly talk about the function of LDH. So this paper was titled, The Regulation and Function of Lactate Dehydrogenase A, Therapeutic Potential in Brain Tumor. And it says here that lactate dehydrogenase A is a cytosolic enzyme predominantly involved in an anaerobic and aerobic glycolysis, or the Warburg effect, or as Dr. Seafried calls, cytosolic substrate-level phosphorylation. However, it has multiple additional functions in non-neoplastic and neoplastic tissues, which are not commonly known or discussed. This review summarizes what is currently known about the function of LDHA and identifies areas that would be benefit from further exploration. And we see here, simplistically, we have pyruvate, the end product of glycolysis. And remember, it has two fates. It either can go into the mitochondria and be used in the TCA cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, and it can be then converted or fermented into lactic acid here through lactate dehydrogenase. We see here that there are multiple isoforms of LDH in different parts of the body, LDH 1 through 6. And what it has here for us is it has the kind of basic cellular mechanisms of LDH. And it says here the role of LDH in cellular metabolism. It says under normal physiologic conditions, pyruvate is generated from glucose by glycolysis and enters the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle in the mitochondria where it is oxidatively decarboxylated to form acetyl-CoA, which is used to fuel oxidative phosphorylation, theoretically generating 36 net ATP or adenosine triphosphate per molecule of glucose. However, when oxygen becomes scarce or in hypoxic conditions, cells are unable to use oxphos or oxidative phosphorylation to efficiently generate ATP. In this scenario, Glycolysis becomes the main generator of ATP, producing two net ATP per molecule of glucose. However, NAD is required to establish the sixth step of glycolysis as glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase, GAPDH, uses NAD to convert glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, GADP, to D16 biphosphoglycerate, 13 BPG. NAD is usually generated through oxidative phosphorylation by the electron transport chain. So when the oxygen supply is restricted, NAD is regenerated from NADH by lactate dehydrogenase A in order to maintain glycolysis, generating lactate as the byproduct. This is known as anaerobic glycolysis. Although it is less efficient, anaerobic glycolysis is 100 times faster than oxphos or oxidative phosphorylation, enabling it to fulfill the short-term energy requirements and the absence of sufficient oxygen at the expense of a greater consumption of glucose. So let's take a look at this here. So glucose 
is going to cost us two ATP molecules here to get to this step. And then later on, we're going to recapture that by obtaining four molecules. So there is a net of two gained ATP molecules. Then we're going to take NAD and we're going to, two of those molecules are going to be converted to NADH. And then those NADHs are going to be reconverted back to NAD by lactate dehydrogenase. This is what they're talking about here. This is under normal physiologic conditions when oxygen is scarce or hypoxia is happening or tissue is not being perfused with blood. So it's a hypoxic condition for that tissue. So it's moving on to this for as long as it can hold out until oxygen, blood, et cetera, is restored to the tissue so that it can go back to aerobic metabolism through oxphos and normal mitochondria. This is also known as anaerobic metabolism. This would be the same thing if you go and sprint or go do a HIT session on a fan bike, or if you were to drown or have sepsis or hypovolemic shock, this is what happens. So again, lactic acidosis is something that is known to happen in a variety of pathophysiologic conditions, one of which is sepsis. And I've even pulled um, from one of my resources that I have available to me up to date, at least a wide range of conditions that lead to a lactic acid production or a lactic acidosis. Some of the things you may or may not recognize here. So here's sepsis. That is something we check lactate on all the time. It happens very commonly in seizures, excess exercise. I haven't personally seen that in clinical practice, but I know that it can happen. Severe asthma, why hypoxia likely, and then any, any degree of shock where there's decreased oxygen delivery to the system or blood delivery to the system, that could be a septic shock, that could be a cardiogenic shock, that could be acute hypoxic respiratory failure from pulmonary edema or multiple reasons, pneumonia, et cetera. Basically any, any condition that leads to severe hypoxemia or low oxygen. And then again, I think this is what made me put an arrow here is that this is the uncertain mechanism supposedly and it's saying cancer and malignancy is an uncertain mechanism. Well, I can tell you that it's been fairly well understood for more than 100 years and was first noted by Warburg, which led the term Warburg effect to be coined after him. I think this is very interesting that it says uncertain mechanism here. So one other thing I wanted to mention was there is a process in which lactate is recycled. So let's say hypothetically you have hypotension or low blood pressure and you don't have enough oxygen and blood getting to the tissues, you're going to go into anaerobic metabolism. Or if you were to do a very intense HIIT workout, you're going to be using anaerobic metabolism. You're going to be using glucose and turning it into lactate because there's not enough oxygen to power that system. So therefore, the lactate is going to be converted back to glucose through the liver in something called the Cori cycle. This is the Cori cycle. So again, glucose getting converted to pyruvate, pyruvate getting converted to lactate or fermented via LDH. Then lactate is going to be transported outside the cell, back to the bloodstream, back to the liver. The liver is going to reconvert it to pyruvate. And then through an ATP driven process, it's going to be converted through gluconeogenesis back to glucose, and it's going to be redistributed into the bloodstream. You'll see later, this is a problem for cancer patients in particular and cachexia. So again, we were talking about under normal physiologic conditions that when glucose is metabolized fully, it will go through the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation system and it'll generate roughly 36 ATP. When you're in the Warburg metabolism or when you're in anaerobic metabolism, you are only making two ATP from the same amount of glucose. One glucose molecule instead of 36 makes two. What they were saying in that last article is basically that one advantage to anaerobic metabolism, it is at a, it's a hundred times faster. Even though it's not as efficient at using the same carbon molecule, it's a hundred times faster. And so therefore it's able to make quick energy and make it also kind of without the same control mechanisms that happen under normal physiologic conditions using mitochondrial respiration. A couple of other things I want to mention here. So let's just take a look at a normal non-tumoral oxidative cell here for a second. So we have glycolysis is where we've been looking at for the last couple of slides here. This is a, a, a zoom out of that. Glycolysis gets turned into pyruvate. Here's the two ATP net we get from that, right? 
then pyruvate under normal conditions, when we have oxygen present, when we have functional mitochondria, when we don't have certain blockades in place, we have pyruvate getting into the TCA cycle and then getting fully converted into basically CO2 and water through oxphos, and that's known as aerobic conditions. We also can, can do the same thing using fatty acids and ketone bodies and proteins and amino acids. They all coalesce at the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. However, what we're talking about here, the mechanism in which anaerobic metabolism is happening, I'm going to use this Warburg cell as an example here. So we're using glycolysis. We're In this case, we're pretending that these mitochondria are not defective, that there is low oxphos, not because there's broken mitochondria, but because there's just no oxygen available. So therefore, it's going to switch over to glycolysis and glutaminolysis as well. It's another phenomenon that happens where large amounts of lactic acid and succinic acid is happening when you have like a cardiac arrest or hypotension or shock or something like that. Again, we have a normal cell. It's taking in 1x amount of glucose, making 1x amount of pyruvate. It's going in through the normal oxidative phosphorylation system and making ATP that way. Whereas a cancer cell, because oxphos is broken, because mitochondria are broken, because we have blockades in the form of PDK through hypoxia and factors, pyruvate is being hyperconverted to lactate. And this is where the lactate that apparently up to date doesn't have any idea of why malignancy produces lots of lactate. That is the mechanism right here. This has been known for a hundred years. Again, we have the Warburg effect or what Dr. Seafried calls cytosolic substrate level phosphorylation or aerobic glycolysis, the other way to say it. Basically, oxygen is present. It doesn't matter because it's, it's still using cytosolic substrate level phosphorylation. That's going to produce lots of lactate. Lactate is going to be transported outside the cell, lead to a tumor microacidotic situation. That's going to lead to ion trapping, chemotherapy resistance. I just learned this a couple days ago. I didn't realize this, but the lactic acid actually can upregulate some of the signaling enzymes such as PIK3, HIF1-alpha, et cetera. And then the acidosis leads to an, a, a blockade of our immune response, which can then further damage therapies. Again, this is just a refresher on topics that we've talked about before. I have a whole video on lactic acid in the past when I first started the channel, but I'm just going to do a quick refresher. Physiologic pH for humans is 7.35 to 7.45. When large amounts of lactate and succinate are exported outside the cell into the tumor microenvironment, TME, tumor microenvironment, it gets acidified by these acid, these organic acids, the lactate and the succinate, the pH will drop substantially to 6 to 6.5, which is enough to suppress our immune system, lead to chemotherapy resistance, and also support metastatic spread. How does it do it? Lactate induces tumor angiogenesis overall by various mechanisms, cancer cell, endothelial cell, or macrophage. Exposure to lactate was phenotypically shown to induce endothelial cell proliferation migration, tube formation, vessel sprouting from aortic explants, angiogenesis in the egg chorioallantoic membrane and rabbit cornea models and tumor angiogenesis in mice. Also, lactic acid stimulates amino acid metabolism. We'll talk about this in the future. In cancer cells expressing MCT1, a second signaling activity of lactate is linked to its positive regulation of amino acid metabolism. In these cells, PhD inhibition by lactate-derived pyruvate not only leads to HIF-1-alpha, but also HIF-2-alpha stabilization and HIF-2 activation. HIF-2 was reported to enhance mix signaling, therefore promoting glutamine uptake and metabolism through enhanced expression of N-word glutamine transporter ASCT2 and glutamine metabolism enzyme glutaminase 1, GLS1. That's the enzyme that Don blocks. Moreover, Lactate-induced glutamine metabolism was shown to activate mTOR, a key nutrient sensor and master regulator of cell growth, which stimulates protein synthesis. Whether lactate can simultaneously simulate autophagy via LDH1 and protein synthesis via mTOR in cancer cells is an open question. Lactate can inhibit histone deacetylases. Extracellular lactate inhibits HDACs, resulting in histone hyperacetylation, reducing chromatin compactness and changes in gene expression. In particular, lactate-induced hyperacetylation was reported to facilitate DNA repair and promote cancer cell resistance to chemotherapy. GPR81 silencing and MCT1 inhibition were both shown to interfere with this process. Lactate-induced histone hyperacetylation thus links extracellular lactate to intracellular epigenome 
regulation, genome stability, and therapy evasion. And lastly, lactate induces immune tolerance. In tumors, lactic acid impairs anti-cancer immunity by repressing T cell proliferation, dendritic cell maturation, and natural killer cell activity. Again, that is basically showing at least many of the reasons why lactic acid and succinic acid and this tumor microenvironment that is quite acidic at 6 to 6.5 pH is a big problem for us, which is going to lead nicely into why lactate dehydrogenase could be an important therapeutic target for enhancement of ketogenic metabolic therapy. If you like videos like this, please like, share, and subscribe. Until next time.